pediatrician became a public policy in Mexico during the 20th century. She's also one of our organizers of the um, of our Lozano Long Conference, which is about food, about food waste next week. And I'll let her at some point take a chance to take the opportunity <laughs> to um, publicize that a little bit. Um, but first things first. I'd also like to welcome and introduce our uh, the Consul General of Mexico in Austin, um, Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, um, who is here and will uh, speak to us briefly before we begin. He is the current Consul General here in Austin. You came in almost two years ago, correct? Uh, yeah. You had no idea what you were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he uh, has been appointed by Mexico's current president to serve 23 counties in Texas. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Southern California with a master's in international relations. And prior to Austin, he worked in other consulates as Consul General of Mexico in Sacramento, California, as a Consul of Community Affairs in Los Angeles. So, thank you. Um, Thank you, Jeannie, and thank you for uh, inviting me. I say many. Fr I, I, I see a lot of friends. I'm, um, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm grateful for the invitation to present to present this distinguished panel. Uh, very briefly, um, I a couple of weeks ago I was here when um, the president of El Colegio de México, our alma mater. <laughs> was um, uh, in the same room, and I remember that was the day or the day after that um, the president of Mexico had to cancel um, his encounter with the new president of the United States. And I remember um, asking those who were present, ¿Qué onda? No? <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain what your president is doing? Because I never saw that in my lifetime. I would see, I would be witness of the President of Mexico canceling uh, its scheduled meeting with the President of the United States. And uh, little did I know that in just two weeks later, um, our very beautiful and lovely city of Austin, always very plural, very inclusive, very welcoming to newcomers, was going to be involved was going to be the epicenter, ground zero, of uh, this ice sting operation that um, those who have lived here for many years and involved in these um, matters tell me had never happened before, never remember a situation like this. Uh, in the last weekend, um, approximately 53 Mexican nationals were detained, mostly by, I mean, mostly on Thursday, Friday, and then a few on Saturday and Sunday. It was apparently targeted operations, but we could document that uh, in most cases were bystanders, people who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we all witnessed, and we are witnessing the impact in terms of anxiety and stress in the community that uh, is created and that unfortunately will last uh, perhaps a few long. So I'm glad to be here. It's sad to be reminded that elections has consequences, so immediate, so local, so so present to all of us. But I think that what um, uh, Lilas is doing with this urgent panel is the right thing to do. Stop and think, sit down, exchange ideas freely and see how can we be better prepared. So thank you very much for inviting me, and congratulations to all my friends and panelists for uh, being here and giving us this opportunity. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, well, I'm going to introduce uh, each one of our speakers, and then each of them will uh, cover topics that they're like, experts in. Uh, and I'm going to start with Denise Gilman, who is right here. Uh, with Denise Gilman, who is here next to me. Uh, so Denise is a clinical professor and the director of the immigration clinic here at UT School of Law. Uh, in the past, she has been a member of the American Bar Association. 
uh, Commission on Immigration. In addition, she has worked in, in international human rights law in Latin America and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights uh, at Human Rights First. And she has also served as the director of the Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project at the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. That's the longest name <laughs> ever. <laughs> but very distinguished lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> lawyer of the year. <laughs> Last year. And this year too then. <laughs> anyway. So our sec fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> the second the second our second panelist is Barbara Hines. Uh, immigration attorney, Barbara. Sorry. Uh, Barbara is a former clinical professor of law and director of the immigration clinic at the UT School of Law. She's an Emerson Senior Fellow and an active member of the Raices Carnes Pro Bono Coordinating Committee that provides legal services and advocacy around the detention of mothers and children at the Carnes Family Detention Center. She also continues to serve on the board of the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild. Thank you, Barbara, for being with us. Now, uh, we have Ricardo Ains, Ansley, mm, the chair of uh, the Mexico Center and professor of educational psychology here at UT. Uh, so, Ricardo is a professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, and he has recently named chair of the LILAS Mexico Center. His current and past work has focused on communities in the U.S. and Mexico that have experienced significant conflict, violence, and transformation, exploring broader questions about how communities absorb crises and live within them. To convey the ideas and experiences behind these communities, he incorporates the critical use of media, including documentary film and photographic experience. Ex exhibits, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, and uh, we have with us the great pleasure of, of having Juan Bellman, who is a UT student. Uh, he is a senior here at UT, and he's studying anthropology with a minor in Latin American studies. Juan has been involved in organizing and advocating for undocumented immigrants since 2012 with the University Leadership Initiative. Juan plans to further his studies, pursuing a master's degree in policy and law in order to aid his ability to assist communities who are organizing to improve uh, their well-being around the world. So thank you, Juan, for being with us today. Uh, so um, I would like to uh, start with... Sure, thank you. We're, we're, we'll, we'll go on or in order. First, uh, Denise, then Ricardo, then Juan, and then Barbara. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Great, so thank you very much, Pilar, and, and thank you to Lilas and the Mexican Center for, for putting this together. I, I do think that it's extremely uh, timely to be talking about these issues, and so we'll try to go relatively quickly so that we can get to some conversation and, and questions. Um, as the consul mentioned, there have been you know new developments even as we've been planning this event, and it does feel a lot like sort of whiplash, like you, mm -hmm. you, know, you start trying to address one situation and think about one situation, and then you're pulled in another direction, so, um, so forgive any uh, sort of disorganization that, that results from that. Um, but I'm going to be, I've been tasked with talking about sort of what's happening at the border, uh, and specifically the executive order that addresses border security issues as they're framed. Um, but to put, to put that in context, it is worthwhile to recall that there were actually three different executive orders that were all issued the week of January 25th um, that related to immigration. Uh, they are intertwined, of course, and they overall present uh, a very troubling picture of uh, claims of border and immigration out of control and then present a series of very enforcement and sovereignty focused measures in response. Uh, but they each take on slightly different aspects of the immigration world and the immigration laws. Um, and so there's one on the border, there's one on sort of interior enforcement, and then there's the famous uh, Muslim ban, as it's known, or entry ban, which is a bit of a misnomer because it extends beyond pure entries into the, into the country. So I'm going to be looking at the border 
order. Um, and again, it, it really does in significant part function to cast our experiences on the border in a very particular light, and that light is one of extreme danger and national security concerns and vulnerability at the border. So first and foremost, it includes language about the extent to which uh, we are facing a significant threat to national security. Uh, it talks about how illegal immigration presents a clear and present danger to the interests of the United States. And it talks about a recent surge at the southern border uh, with Mexico, which has placed a significant strain on resources, agencies, and local communities. Um, there's no recognition of immigration as a favorable, uh, having favorable impacts, of being a favorable aspect of uh, relations between the United States and Mexico, uh, no recognition of other aspects of sort of trade. And, and back and forth uh, communications between the two countries. It's all about sovereignty and security. Um, so with that lens, uh, one of the first things that the executive order on the border does is it insists that there will be a border wall built, uh, a physical structure built. Um, even though, in fact, the border communities along the border have been empirically shown to be actually quite safe, uh, it has also been quite clearly acknowledged, if you look at the actual numbers of irregular border crossings, that in fact there is no surge, there's not even any particular crisis at the border. There are certainly some humanitarian challenges. Um, but in fact, if you look at the numbers, I apologize to those of you who've heard me say this ad nauseum, but I have to keep repeating it because it's just so relevant. Um, the numbers show that in 2000, we had about 1.6 million irregular border <laughs> crossers. In 2014, at the height of the so-called surge that people were talking about, which again, I, I would definitely object to the phrasing, we had under 400,000 irregular border crossers a significant percentage of which were women and children from Central America fleeing horrific rates of violence in the Northern Triangle. Uh, so to think of that as a security threat, as a crisis at the border, um, seems out of place. Um, so nonetheless, uh, there's, this, uh, rec or there's this order to, to build a wall. There's no acknowledgment of the fact that there are, in fact, segments of wall built along the southern, southern border, that there was a major construction effort in 2007, 2008, including on the Texas-Mexico border, uh, that many of us here at UT looked at and worked on and found to be deeply problematic, causing environmental problems, uh, deprivation of property without that the government has to go in and take land from private property owners along the border to build the wall, um, destruction of sort of border communities that have all seen themselves as being two halves of the same whole along the border, no knowledge of any of that, uh, pretty clearly uh, intended to be sort of a political message of, uh, of again, crisis and security at the border. Um, the other thing that the executive order on the border does is it talks about sort of externalization of the border in a couple of really interesting ways that have received a little bit less attention but that are very worrisome. So to put this in context, we had already been seeing through the fall of 2016 cases where those Central American women and children and in general Central American asylum seekers were being turned away when they approached Border Patrol crossing a bridge seeking protection and being told there's no room for you. Central Americans being sent back to Mexico to wait. Well, it looks like this order sort of attempts to institutionalize that process and make it even longer. There's even a specific provision that allows for certain kinds of proceedings to take place, immigration court proceedings to determine status on the Mexico side of the border. Uh, so there's a lot to be concerned about there. Not to say that it's lawful, uh, but, but it is deeply concerning. Um, and there's, there's some concern that, um, given the rhetoric around uh, Mexico helping to build the border wall, uh, that there may also be some degree of, of effort to try to get Mexican officials to help with this externalization of our border, to stop individuals from ever reaching the U.S. border to seek protection. So deeply concerning. Um, 
probably most important sort of from my perspective of uh, the kind of work that we've been doing on family detention and other detention issues over um, the last years is that the order explicitly mandates increased detention, construction of new detention facilities, which will almost certainly have experienced dictates, uh, be constructed but by private prison entities who have great uh, incentives to, to profit from um, locking up asylum seekers and others. So expanded detention, um, detention throughout proceedings, so including for asylum seekers who previously might have been released after initially apprehended while they went through their asylum cases. Those would uh, presumably under the order as it mandates now be detained throughout their proceedings. And rapid accelerated deportations, um, that the proceedings would be um, moved along much more quickly um, and that people would be returned as promptly as possible. So a vast expansion of detention and deportations. Um, and uh, my time is up, but I do want to note that this would be sort of on top of a level of detention and deportation accelerated that we had been seeing in the years preceding leading up to where we are today that was already very, very expansive. But the, the Republican administration has taken this to an entirely new level uh, where we can expect to see vast numbers of new facilities and asylum seekers and others in detention. Um, so I'll pass it along from there. Thank you, Ed and uh, Bienvenidos. And uh, thank you all for, for coming to today. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to address before uh, about 30 minutes ago. I, there was so much information, and there's been so much happening. Uh, but I think I'm, I'll start with sort of a broad framing of the current situation as one that is appropriately called a crisis. Uh, when as the consul points out, when the president of Mexico decides not to attend a presidential meeting with the American president who's literally been in office less than two weeks, <coughs> that is a crisis. That signals an extremely unusual situation. And when we look at the policies and the presidential orders, I should say, that have been enacted in the last three weeks, that too reflects or actually creates an added sense of crisis. And I want to speak, since I'm a psychologist, I want to speak to the sense of how this is landing, how these decisions are landing in communities, not only in Austin, but all over the country. And, and, and I'll start with, with a couple of examples. Just last week, the council and I were having lunch at a restaurant when the waiter, who's American, brings a note to the consul and says, that says, in so many words, Dear Mr. Consul, we are the cooks at this restaurant. May we have a few minutes with you after your lunch? You could, it was a restaurant where the, the, you could see the kitchen and so on. After the lunch, the council met with these two women. And uh, uh, on, on Friday, we were on the phone, and he says, uh, you won't believe what they told me. They are absolutely terrified. One has been here 17 years. The other has been here 15 years. Neither of them has documents. Both of them own their own homes. The question they posed was, if we get deported, does the American government have the right to seize our property? This is the level of fundamental anxiety that people are living. That same restaurant was written up in, I think it was the Texas Tribune, a few days later, closing its lunch services because these two women had decided to not go to work for fear of what was happening. So it may be that only 53, only 53 people were apprehended last weekend, but the reverberations send 
a very clear and powerful message throughout the communities that are impacted. And it's not only Mexican and South American communities either. Everybody who's here, even people with papers, are afraid to leave their homes. Another example of the impact. A woman spoke to me last week, on Tuesday actually, and she says, I have papers. Thank God last year I got papers. But there's a woman at my church who was a victim of severe domestic violence. She has two children. She is afraid of going to CPS, afraid that she will become identified that she will be deported, and what's going to happen with her children who have seen her partner literally threaten her life, physically threaten her life. These are just situations that are coming up all over that aren't making the news, but they're very real, they're very problematic, and they, they, they really speak to the, to the collective anxiety and the collective stress that people are living. So, so I, I guess I want us to, to, to kind of consider this. Um, I've had students say, you know, I was born here, I'm fine, but I have family members who don't have papers in Houston. I'm scared for my family. This is a universal situation for in, in immigrant communities, not only in Austin, not only in Texas, but all over the country, because I think what's happened is that, is that we're having these sort of targeted uh, interventions that are sending a, a, a collective message that are creating real anxieties. Not, not imagined anxieties, but real anxieties. As we know, people are actually being apprehended. So I think I'll stop there and, and we can continue the conversation. Um, All right. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Juan Um I'm, So I'm, my status here is currently I have DACA, but as we've seen, DACA doesn't really mean much anymore uh, because at any point it can be taken away. Uh, it was just an executive order, and I can speak more to the anxieties that you mentioned because like, not only I, but my mom, uh, my dad, and my brother are undocumented. So we face this reality on a day-to-day -day basis, like seeing all these rates happening and seeing what's going on in our community. Like, we've had to have conversations with my mom about what's gonna happen in case they're detained, what's gonna happen to my younger brothers because I have 11 year old and two year old, what's gonna happen to them? So right now we're having those tough conversations to figure out what's gonna happen if this happens or that happens. Um, I was in the United States at the age of 10. Uh, it was my mom, myself, and my brother. My brother was four. Uh, I went to elementary, middle, and high school in Austin. And then I came to the University of Texas. And that's where I experienced how my undocumented status affected me and my family. Uh, because my freshman year, my father was detained by immigration. And it wasn't because it was a raid or anything. It was because of the programs that were uh, in place back in the day. Uh, through the Obama administration. So it was through the Secure Communities Program uh, because the police uh, stopped my father uh, and his co-workers while they were coming back. Um, they proceeded to detain all of them and put them in the detention centers. Um, but the thing is, uh, many of them signed their voluntary departure uh, because they were all intimidated to do this. Uh, my father, luckily, even after all the intimidation that he signed, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to fight his case. Um, his case was administratively closed in 2013, uh, which to my understanding is, he doesn't have any more court hearings, uh, but at any point his case can be brought up again, and the uh, proceedings can continue. Um, so right now, with hearing all these things about like, they're going after certain individuals, it like really, create anxiety in myself because I didn't know if my father was one of those persons who was in that list. Like if I was gonna, one of these days show up to my house and knock on the door and either detain my mom or go after my father at his job site. Um, 
But aside from all of that, we're also like right now facing um, a tough battle here in the state of Texas uh, with SB4. So SB4 is a bill that would allow basically um, the police to work with uh, ICE and to cooperate with them and as for our immigration status. Uh, so not too long ago, we went and testified. It was over 400 people who testified against the bill. Um, and over a thousand who went inside as opposing the bill. But even then, they passed this bill uh, in front of the committee, seven to two, and then it was passed from the Senate. So now it's going to the House. And this is a bill that we had been fighting. And that week, when we were gonna go testify, we heard about the possibility of these rates. Um, and right away, we didn't know how to handle this information, what to do with, the, with knowing that rates might be happening in our community because we didn't want to create fear in our community. We didn't want to also like not, not, not let our community know what was gonna happen. So what we decided there and then to do was do Know Your Rights forums. And that's what we've been doing right now in our community, trying to inform our community about their rights, what to do in case